here we are live and on location at the Catholic Marketing Network in Somerset, New Jersey, where I have a chance to catch up with some of the authors who are here attending the show. Here is Mr. Phil Lawler, who is the co-author of a book called A Call to Serve, Pope Francis and the Catholic Future. Well, Mr. Lawler, it's great to meet you in person after all of these years. You've been it's associated with EW10 and Catholic Media for quite a while. Yes, I have. Uh, I founded Catholic World News back in 1996, and you caught me. I'm very bad at dates, but at some point, Mother Angelica decided she wanted a news service, and for a while, Catholic World News was the official news service of EWTN, so uh, we do go back a ways. Right, and now you actually, you still have a, uh, like a website and yes, everything, right? Yes, now Catholic World News is part of the Catholic Culture website. And uh, we're posting news every day and commentary as well. And who do you do that? We have a partner in that, don't you, basically? Yeah, Jeff Miras from Catholic. Now, Jeff Catholic. Miras was also involved early he with was. the network because uh, he kind of started the online That's right. uh, service that then became EWTN That's right. Online. Right. right. And at the time, we weren't working together. Jeff and I were both working for EWTN. Okay. Then after we both left EWTN, we got together. Right. So, and so how long has that been going on? Oh, again six years roughly and what's your focus you know there's a lot of catholic uh, websites out there uh, it is, is it a blogosphere kind of situation is it a news service how do you view it well what i'm doing is mostly news but the catholic culture site as a whole is as the name implied uh, aimed at building a catholic culture so uh, we're trying to give a fairly uh, high level intellectual stimulation for people who want to build a culture of the faith in their own communities, in their own families. What would be the kind of stories that I'd go in and see there? Are they headline kind of stories, in-depth pieces, opinion Mostly pieces? Mostly headline stories. I mean, to a large extent, what we're doing is processing what's out there in the secular media. Right, okay. And a lot of times correcting it. Uh, and by correcting, I don't necessarily mean it's wrong, but sometimes the focus is a little a awry. Yeah, askew, uh, right. And yeah, sometimes, exactly. sometimes it's, it's wrong. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. um, Sometimes it's a, a matter of prejudice right. or ignorance, but a lot of times it's just they don't know as much as we know. Right. Uh, people covering the Vatican who don't cover the Vatican most of the time. Well, let me ask you, that's always a question a lot of people will ask me or ask us, which is, uh, do these people do it maliciously? Do they do it on purpose? Is it just naivete? Is it just groupthink? It seems like it seems like it's a little bit of everything mixed in there. It is, yeah. I mean, I don't think there are that many people who are malicious. There are some. Uh, and sometimes, uh, we're all human, sometimes malice comes out in people who wouldn't ordinarily or be. Or have an ax to grind for some reason. Sure. Fallen away Catholics are not always the best. Absolutely, right. sometimes the worst. Or the recovering Catholic, as the one uh, former editor of the New York Times used to refer to yes. himself as, right? Yes. But I think more often it's a question, they don't see the world the way we see it. That. Uh, for instance, the pro-life movement does not come up on their radar screen. You know, uh, uh, sanctity of marriage. It's, it's just not something they think about. Right. Uh, and so we try to contribute that perspective to, right. to augment what they have. Okay, well let me ask you, what about uh, being an author? Uh, how many books have you written or been involved with over the years? Uh, this is my sixth book. This, is, this was one was unique because, for one thing, it was a rush job. You know, as soon as the Pope was elected, we wanted something out. Uh, and so I've never written under that kind of time pressure before. Well, I, you say we wanted something out. Who wanted something? Well, uh, Crossroad Press, okay, the publisher, publisher came, they right, came to right. me. Okay. And the other thing that was unique is that they had a book by my co-author, Stefan uh, von Kempis. Okay. Good name for a Catholic author. Right. Uh, he is a Vatican Radio editor for the German edition. Oh, okay. So he had written an entire book in German, and I was given a literal translation. And of course, it was written for a German audience. Right. So my okay. job was first to make it really English, and second to make it really for an American audience. Well, let me ask you, I can understand how you turn it into a more colloquial English for people to understand, but was there a, an accent or a nuance that was different in the German than you thought would appeal to an American audience? Yes, um, in, in different respects. Uh, more of a European focus, mm, okay. uh, which I thought I definitely wanted to correct for where we have a Pope who's not European. Right. And then uh, we also look back in this book at 
the pontificate of Benedict XVI. And as you can imagine, that has a great deal of appeal to a German audience, okay. some of which I don't think translated well to an American. Well, one of the things that struck me, and, and obviously several of these books came out right around the time of the election and post the election, is that uh, this one has a fair amount of, of, of color art and photographs in right. it. Was that intentional oh, to absolutely. differentiate it? Absolutely. This is, this is meant to be sort of a coffee table book, a keepsake book, uh, a gift book that you can give to somebody. And it, has, it does have quite a bit of very beautiful photography. And uh, I'm not going to pretend that it's a thorough analysis. It right. isn't. It was written about three weeks after he was elected. We don't know the man yet. No, right. We sure didn't well, know Well, we then. certainly have seen post-World Youth Day and things like that. He's full of surprises. Uh, he keeps surprising us, but, right. but we were just starting to be surprised when we wrote this book. But there are also some fun details. I mean, my co-author was there uh, at the conclave uh, and describes it in detail. And, and I'd actually, I'd like to tell one little story. Yeah, go ahead, sure. Because it's a fascinating story. I'm not going to give away the ending. but. At the end of the conclave, when Francis was elected, the first thing he wanted to do was call Pope Emeritus Benedict. But he couldn't, because all of the cardinals had surrendered their cell phones when they went into the conclave. There were no phones in the building. And Pope Francis was running around the building trying to find a phone that worked. <laughs> My co-author was there when he found one, and yeah, it's, right. it's he a talks hilarious about it in the story. Book. Right, yeah. right, right, I saw that, right. The one location. I know where it is, because right? I read it. It's a funny story. <laughs> yeah. I think you'll agree. And if you think about the co-author, you might figure out where he found one that worked. Uh, if you're good. That might be a clue to it yeah. also. Well, let's go to the, in the preface, a grand invitation. It talks about Popes John Paul II and Benedict XVI were brilliant teachers and leaders for their times. Cardinals were not looking for a younger version of either man. The Cardinals were looking for a man with different talents for different times. How so? What were those talents that they were looking for that you, that you well, thought Well, I think were we're different? seeing them come out now. And I think, by the way, any organization is, is wise to think that way. When one leader steps down, it's probably a mistake to look for a clone because there isn't going to be a clone. That's a good you look, point, right. You look for someone who is ready to pick up from where, in this case, Pope Benedict left us. And we have been spoiled in the last 30 years by popes who are great teachers, great theologian, great philosopher. Uh, that's not going to happen all the time. Right. Uh, and what we're looking for now, I think, and what we're getting is someone who can translate that into practical, pastoral, and very attractive message that everybody can relate to. Well, it certainly seemed to be that one of the things we heard, obviously, uh, during the interregnum period, waiting, that there seemed to be a sense that the cardinals wanted someone who wasn't necessarily a, a, a creature of the curia, so to speak. That's someone who had been out in the world, dealing with real people, dealing with a large diocese or something with all its intrinsic issues and right. problems, that, that could bring that knowledge into the papacy. Absolutely. And Pope Francis is conspicuous in that respect. He, he didn't like to go to Rome, which is pretty unusual for a guy. He, he got out of Rome as soon as he could when he visited. Uh, he was absolutely wedded to Buenos Aires, which is, I think, wonderful for a bishop to, be, to feel like he's married to his diocese. Right. It's his spouse, in a way. Uh, and every bit a pastor. And I think that, again, that's coming out. His, his talent is for reaching out to people in a sort of one-on-one -on -one way, even though he's reaching them millions at a time at this point. Right, on page six, right near the beginning, you talk about how you know they spend time in prayer, not politicking. And his quote here from Cardinal Timothy Dolan said that choosing a pope boils down to a spiritual quest. You look for a man who reminds you of Jesus. Yes. And I think regardless of anything to come, I think you can't find somebody who anymore reminds you of Jesus if that's the criteria, right? Right. It's interesting to me that he was, by all reports, the second choice back in 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of cardinals apparently were seeing that at that time. And I think at this point, right. 
it's also fascinating, and we go into this a bit in the book, that he was not listed among the papabili by all the people who think they know these things, myself included. And why was that? I mean, there was a reasoning kind of behind that. Didn't they feel he might be too old? He's a little old. Uh, and also, I guess maybe I thought he had a shot. You know, he, uh -huh. he got his votes. He didn't win. Um, and he certainly wasn't politicking for, politicking right, right. for it. He was, he's not very visible on the international scene. He's stuck to business in Buenos Aires. Right. But I guess uh, his fellow cardinals knew him, and when he spoke at the meetings prior to the conclave, he sort of lit up the, the charts. Right. It's kind of like we heard about uh, when Benedict gave uh, that uh, homily before his ultimate yes. election it seemed to be key to people saying, yes, that's, that's what we need right now, and, and so you're the man to go, go that I way. I think it's very much like that. I think when Pope Benedict was elected, going into the conclave, he was clearly the leader. Mm. It was just a question of whether he would be the pope, <laughs> and of course he was. Going into this conclave, I think the cardinals had a sort of unsettled feeling. Mm -hmm. And there was a great deal of discussion. Some of it leaked, some of it which was very open. Right. And um, there's a sense of trying to figure out where we are. And I think that when uh, Cardinal Bergoglio got up and spoke, they said, yeah, that's, 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 that's the where man. we are. That's the man, right. right. And uh, that's when he emerged. Well, even, and I think you talk about it in the book here, at least unofficially, the word was that clearly Benedict had, in the last interregnum, the last papal conclave, had the most votes, but not quite enough votes. Right. And Bergoglio was number two, and it's when right. Bergoglio finally threw his support, so to speak, to Benedict that that yes. went in that direction. So, yes. so obviously there's a connection there. And so also when people try to make, I, and I think in order to honor Pope Francis, because he's such that way, to talk about his humility, he, uh, Pope Francis has said several times, you know, there's nobody more humble than Benedict. Absolutely. Who else could take, this role as pope and willingly lay it down aside. Right. Right. This, there's been a lot of, I think, unfortunate comparisons made uh, between Pope Francis and Pope Benedict, and I think Pope Francis would be appalled by some of them as well, you know, because they can't, a lot of them make him come off as the good guy. Right. And I, I guarantee he doesn't see it now. Right. And, um, you know, it gets to the point where if they go out to dinner and he orders chocolate and Benedict orders vanilla, they're going to say, well, see right. the other contrast between right, them. I mean, right. they're different. Yeah. But uh, right. it's, it's very obvious that Francis has immense respect for Benedict and sees himself as walking in continuity. Well, do you think sometimes people like to see the differences because ultimately they hope that's a harbinger of changes and other things they don't like? Sure, and it's news. Yeah, right. And, and yeah, accentuating, point, the, accentuating the difference is a headline, saying right. they're the same is not a good headline. Right. Well, you also point out in here uh, that now the church has the first pope ordained after the opening of the council, whose entire ministry has been guided by its vision of renewal. How do you think that will affect the papacy? I think you're already seeing that. I think that you see here a pope who takes, I don't want to say he takes Vatican II for granted, that, but he takes it as read. Mm -hmm. It's been there his whole ministry. His whole ministry has been devoted to the spirit of Vatican II. It's not a change in any way for him from what he was brought up with in his right. ministry. And I think you're seeing that particularly in his call to the laity uh, to, be, to, to evangelize. Right. Uh, I mean, we, we were told in Vatican II it's the age of the laity. And I think it took us a long time to figure out what does that mean. Right. And I think he's, he's going to help us crystallize the meaning. That, right. that and the thing that I find most exciting about him is he, he really speaks to my personal thoughts when he talks about trying to get past what he calls a self-referential church. You know, the church that looks in on itself, where you and I go to Mass on Sunday and then we go about our business, but it's just, right. you know, it's our business. We're not talking to anybody. We're not spreading the faith. Right. Uh, we're not doing what it, we're It's living as do. if we're in a world of freedom of worship and not a freedom of religion where it's yes. okay for us to go and worship and we kind of are yeah, okay, yeah. but we can't take that outside of it, and we point. don't, you know, we don't point, in a yeah. lot of ways. But it's also, it's also a betraying the Lord's mission to us, which was to go out and convert all nations. Well, do you also have a sense that he has, the, 
he's really trying to hit the right tone. When you say the work of the late is evangelization, what he's talking about is going out, like you say, into the world. In, a, in, a, in the, some of the confusion, Pius Vatican seemed to be the idea uh, was that the laity should run up onto the altar. And, Absolutely. And, and, and that's what it meant to get involved and become, quote unquote, active in the church. While the clergy and the religious run out into the world, right, right, which right. is just wrong. Right, right, exactly. It seems Absolutely to be back, right. backwards. You also say, one might also say that John Paul II and Benedict XVI wrote the textbook on Vatican II and Francis was producing the how-to manual. Explain that. I was looking for, as I wrote that, I was looking for a sort of uh, meaty metaphor. Um, that I think his gift is not, he's not an academic. Mm -hmm. He has the mind to be, he has taught, but he's not an academic by training or by uh, instinct, right. by personality. He talks to people, ordinary people in ordinary language. So uh, when you get a papal teaching that maybe you haven't digested, I think it's wise to look to him for what does this mean I should do, you know, tomorrow morning after I brush my teeth. Right. It's very practical, right. pragmatic advice. And clearly in saying that, because sometimes people, in saying one's not an academic has nothing to do with their intellect. No, no. Because, I mean, he's a Jesuit and he's, you know, was he's a very sharp. He's a There's very, no question about that. He's a very bright man. Uh, you said the comfortable Catholics of Europe and North America might feel that they can afford to spend their energies debating but in the global Catholic Church of the 21st century, millions of their brothers and sisters lack food, housing, education, and medical care. And that seems to be where Francis is coming yes. out, right? Yes, very much so. In that he's saying that one of the ways that you convert people is you go out into uh, the suburbs, because most, most of the world, the suburbs is, is the slums. And I think that we need a little translation Yeah, there. it's kind of inverse here, right. right. But to go in, to go to the communities where people need, are in need, and help them because that is a way of evangelization. That's the first step. Right. You know, just as our Lord cured the sick first and then preached. And then you go on to say, still, Pope Francis persistently reminds us that the command of Christ is to not only serve the material needs of the poor, but also even more importantly, to recognize their spiritual needs. And that's where the flip comes in. Because sometimes yes. we get, certainly on the social justice side, an overemphasis on just the works aspect and pressing their spiritual side has seemed like singing for your supper, so we don't really like to do that too Absolutely. much. Absolutely, and he's been very clear on that too. And just this week, I, I was it just the day before yesterday, Pope Francis said something to an Argentine group about how you need to serve those who are in need, uh, but you also have to recognize that sometimes need is psychological or spiritual, and they're probably in your neighborhood, the people who have a crying need for the Lord, a crying need for meaning in their life. They might not be poor, but they are spiritually needy and, and where should be there for them. Right. Now, one of the things early on, there's been some concern, little noise about, he, he, you know, he hasn't talked directly about certainly attacks on the church and things like that. And, and you mentioned here, but at its best, the church does not waste time defending itself any more than Jesus did. What do you mean? Well, I mean, Jesus was unjustly accused and executed. Uh, he could have defended himself. He chose not to. That should be a lesson for us. I, I mean, uh, great saints who have chosen to die for the faith, uh, when they could have fought, should be a lesson to us. I don't mean that we shouldn't fight. I mean, I'm yeah, sure. engaged in well, You are every day, right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. But I, I do mean that the first thing you have to do, people aren't going to be persuaded by being hit over the head with the arguments that they've already heard many, many times. They're going to be persuaded when they have a change of heart, when they begin to think of Jesus as Lord. Right. Uh, that's the first step. When they begin to think that the church has something to tell them about how to cure what is ailing them in their lives, then they'll listen to what the church has to tell them about other things. Well, you say in his first homilies, Pope Francis told the cardinals who elected him that we, quote unquote, we can build many things, but if we do not witness to Jesus Christ, then it doesn't matter. Right. And, and the church isn't an NGO, right? He says that right, frequently. Right, right, it's right. not just a charitable organization. It's, it's a, an organism that exists to spread the gospel. 
So do you think there was any significance of the seagull on the roof? I remember watching that. Now I realize later, maybe he flew away because he felt the heat. I don't know, coming up. Uh, <laughs> well, we begin the book. Yeah. <laughs> right about there, With right. With the seagull, is, yeah. it's just a nice way to begin. It's, I don't know the significance. Right. One of the things that struck me too, and I found this, because we were in the studio the whole time, you know, doing things. I was kind of the local anchor in the States. Right. Uh, with Colleen and Raymond there uh, in Rome, and then during the smoke period, it was it was Colleen. But uh, a lot of our people had trouble, certainly there. We sort of heard the name and got it fairly quickly when it was announced. I did not. Okay, but we were, you know, because we had enough people there who were from di different nationalities to recognize how it was said. But we realized how difficult it was for our team there to understand, and you talk about it in several books I've read, I've talked about those experiences, right. talking about the way it was said right. and how it was said, and since there was not an expectation of that name, right. that there was like almost mass confusion in St. Peter's Square. I'm assuming the uh, your co-author really brought right. that point home, right? Right, although I experienced it watching Watching it at home, yeah, right. Uh, I did not hear, and I spent several minutes trying to figure it out. Yeah, it was kind of, for, for a time, was, you could tell people were, and also uh, uh, the particular cardinal who, who made the announcement had a, it seemed to have, in, in a way, tried to try and say it very right, it, it, he almost had a little tremor in his voice. I guess he was so yeah, nervous that I it made it that was. much. I think he was, and if you recall when Pope Benedict was elected, uh, the cardinal who announced it then, he played it up. Right, right, he right. He really yeah. played it up. <laughs> right, and he billboarded out going out there, right? Yeah. So what is your hope? I mean, when somebody picks up this book and goes through this book, I mean, you've got a wonderful picture on page 73. You've heard so much about uh, the, him riding around on uh, you know subways and buses and things like that. And we knew that because we had worked with him years ago. In fact, he had... Uh, Done, he had done some uh, sections of a couple of series for us, which we've run on the air now called Before, Before He Was Pope. Uh, and we had already heard about the Cardinal who rode the bus and all those kinds of things. So we had no, we had no question about how true that was, because we had heard about that many years ago, before his name had even come up in the uh, original conclave uh -huh. with Benedict. So uh, what, what is your hope for someone reading and going through this book? What, do you, what is it? You go through his story, uh, him as a youth, you have that powerful story where he's thinking of getting married. He feels like he has to go to confession. He goes to confession and something happens there that convinces him that he's supposed to become a priest. Right. Right. It's a fascinating life. I mean, what is my expectation? I, I think that most people in the world already know this is a fascinating man. And my hope is that if they pick up this book, they'll get a better understanding of what kind of man he is right. and they'll know he's more fascinating than they thought <laughs> and one of the things you say Cardinal Bergoglio wrote you look for him meaning God but he has already been looking for you and he learned later that the young priest who had heard his confession on the fateful day died of leukemia a year after it's a fascinating incident it's fascinating partly because he's never said that much about it right, right. something happened right and, and something related to the mercy of God yes. and, and things like that, which clearly you can see his focus on that. Oh, very much so. And, and God's forgiveness and God's mercy. And even in some of the things recent, Larry, where there's been some concerns about certain uh, appointments or other things where he seems to be saying, and obviously I think what he's saying is correct, but it seems to be misunderstood yes. in, in the media. Of course, they play it up as meaning something other than it is in a sense of saying if someone has repented and things will, if right. God has forgiven them, how can I not forgive them? Right. Effectively right. is basically what he's saying. John Allen says that if you want to sum them up in a phrase, it's the Pope of mercy. I think that's right. right. I think that's going to be the, the theme that comes through most clearly of his pontificate, is just to understand and embrace the mercy of God. Yeah, in January 2013, in a sermon preached in the Vatican Basilica, he reflected that, quote unquote, bravery consists not in lashing out aggressively, but enduring a beating and standing up against prevailing opinions. In an era, era marked by rising hostility to Christianity, he said, we will also be beaten by those who oppose the gospel. That's what you were kind of saying too earlier, that in a sense of Christ-like, mm -hmm. taking on the abuses mm -hmm. and, and not the idea that somehow we're supposed to slay the enemy. Right. And I think he's a pope also who conveys things in a different way, not by sort of making public statements, 
but by talking more in a one-on-one -on -one way. And again, it's really a challenge to do Almost that. Almost like Mother Teresa, that very much of that, you see him move and focus directly on a person and really look into that person's yes. eyes. You know? And I think, actually, I think both of his predecessors had that gift too, right, that they right. could speak to a million people, but you thought he, would, he was right. just speaking to you. Right, exactly. You didn't notice all the other people around. Well, let me ask you, since we're just about out of time here at the CMN, talking about your book, what's next? You got another book you're thinking of in the works? I do. Or? I do have another book in Can the works. Can you hint about it, or are you afraid somebody's going to steal the idea? Actually, I have one book that's just about to roll off the presses okay. about the new success stories in the new evangelization. Oh, okay. It's called When Faith Goes Viral. Okay. And it will be ready, uh, I think, September 1st for publication. Okay. okay, great. Well, we'll look forward to seeing that too. Well, thank you, Phil. Thank thanks you for, for having Thanks me. for having your time. Speaking here with Philip Lawler about his book, A Call to Serve, Pope Francis and the Catholic Future, published by Crossroads, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Thank you for joining us here on location for Bookmark from the Catholic Marketing Network in Somerset, New Jersey. See you next time.